Welcome to Case in Point, produced by the University of Pennsylvania Law School in collaboration with Bloomberg Law. I'm your host, Steve Barnes. Today we'll be talking about what the election of Donald Trump means for U.S.-China trade and for the global economy. We're pleased to be joined by two experts. First, William Burke White, who is the Richard Perry Professor and a Professor of Law, as well as the Director of the Perry World House here at the University of Pennsylvania. Joining us from Arlington, Virginia, we have Jerome Ashton, who's a managing editor at Bloomberg Law. So we'll start with you first, Bill. Clearly a lot of ground to cover here and still much to be determined and to be seen, but Donald Trump has publicly articulated what seems to be some protectionist policies or stances and as well has stated his opposition to the TPP. To start, let's just define our terms. What is the TPP and where in the big picture of U.S.-China trade does the TPP fit in? Sure, Steve. The TPP is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It is an agreement uh, that has been negotiated over the past 10 years among uh, countries uh, on the Asia-Pacific Rim, ranging from the United States to Chile uh, to Singapore, Vietnam, and Japan. Um, when it was concluded, it would have been the largest trade agreement outside of the WTO in the world, covering uh, about 60% or more of world trade. Uh, it's important uh, because it really was going to be the future trade but also kind of political alliance. It's about trade, it's about investment, it's also about regulatory harmonization, bringing these countries together. And Donald Trump has said that on his first day in office he will withdraw, we haven't actually ratified it yet, but he'll withdraw from the process of ratifying it uh, and tear up the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Very quick follow-up. And the general I, or thought, I guess, behind his position is that he wants to keep U.S. jobs. Is that the general yeah. idea? So you've mentioned that Trump has talked about protectionism. Uh, in his view, ripping up the TPP is a way of keeping jobs at home, because if there are more trade barriers, then he thinks those jobs won't leave the country. What he misses is the fact that we already have free trade agreements with many of these countries, uh, and that this is about more than trade. It's also about politics uh, and really the future of the international system in a much broader way. All right. Well, we'll get to the future of the yeah. international system in a moment, but for you, Jerome, so Recently, China has been discussing a, a rival trade agreement, a free trade, a free trade area of the Asia Pacific. So if uh, President Trump does not uh, ratify the TPP, what do you think the prospects are for China's alternative like a free trade area? There are several countries that are uh, part of TPP and part of the regional agreement that China is trying to pull together. The experts that we talk to seem to think that if the U.S. pulls out of TPP, it will make the China-led agreement a virtual reality as countries in the Asia-Pacific that are sort of straddling between the two are much more likely to move closer to China, China's trade influence, and strategic influence. Right. And because you're so close to Washington, D.C., sort of what are you hearing in terms of what might be a more traditional a GOP or Republican position on trade, which tends to favor free markets. Exactly. It's interesting now that we're past the election, we'll go back to uh, normalcy, whatever that is. It appears that there is some early word that some of the Trump positions on trade, beyond pulling out of TPP, as Professor White just mentioned, may meet with some resistance. You've seen the stories in the last couple of days about the 35% tariff rate and all, and that's already getting some pushback from Republicans on the Hill. So this is still to be played out because it's such an unusual situation, but it, it doesn't look like it's going to play out the way that envisioned uh, during the campaign by uh, President-elect Trump. Your right. thoughts, Bill? Um, yeah, I think that, uh, first of all, uh, Jerome's totally right in the sense that these countries uh, have undergone huge sacrifices to join the TPP, and they're frustrated at the United States at the moment. Um, and I do think they're going to find themselves in China's uh, ambit. I also think, though, that uh, there will be some pushback. Maybe not on TPP. TPP has been so politicized in this campaign that it's going to be hard to resurrect it on both the left and the right. But on some of the other trade issues, uh, Trump's going to have a lot harder time uh, for things that he can't simply do as a matter of executive power. Right. So uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, the possibility of a trade war. So how likely do you think that is, just given the way free trade has, has evolved, I mean, even in the last 
during the last couple presidencies within the U.S. And in terms of a trade war, what would that actually potentially look like in more concrete terms? So I am less worried about a trade war than I am about America losing its strategic position as a leader on trade, uh, and I think that's what's going to happen. One of the reasons I'm not so worried about a trade war, I got back from China yesterday. The last thing the Chinese want is a trade war. Um, they have actually been fairly restrained in responding to some of Trump's more provocative statements because a trade war hurts them as much as it hurts us. What I do think we're going to see is that Trump will impose tariffs in certain key sectors uh, that are politically salient, on steel, for example. Those tariffs will be a violation of the WTO, um, and eventually the WTO will come to the United States and say that's illegal. Um, China might reciprocate on some things, but I don't see this spiraling into a kind of 1930s era uh, protectionism because it is in so much US and Chinese interests to avoid that trade war. So I think Trump will play some politics, but hopefully not lead us into a full-on trade war. Mm -hmm. And Jerome, your perspective? Yes, I, I agree exactly with all of that, that a trade war, a full-blown trade war is unlikely, but skirmishes are likely. And we've had those over the years, the U.S. imposing duties on steel and other um, imports from China, China retaliating with uh, duties on, ch on chickens and, and other commodities. So look for more of that. But I, I think the professor is absolutely right. A full-blown trade war would be disastrous for both economies and for the international economy. So it'll be interesting as the Republicans on the Hill and others on the Hill get more involved in the trade process, what you really see. And I think it'll be something less than a full-blown trade war. Given the fact that none of this is happening in a vacuum on the global stage, what do you think this means for the transatlantic trade and investment partnership and for the U.S.-EU trade relationship overall? Good question. I think all of this, um, and I'll backtrack if I could for just a second, I think even with TPP and TTIP, the transatlantic deal and the others, you'll have a period of sort of settling out where you won't see a whole lot of activity on this since just the area is so toxic publicly. But trade is such a vital area, is so vital to the economies, that what you'll see is that trade will come back, I think, maybe wrapped up in different packages such as a jobs bill or infrastructure and other things that you may not see a big initial effort but trade's not going away. And, and certainly from the early reports on the Hill, there's many Republicans who still like TPP. They still want to push for a deal with the European Union and other uh, deals uh, beyond that because um, this is such a template for future deals. It's, it would be surprising if it all fell apart. What about the prospects of the TPP passing? Do you think that's a possibility, Jerome? I don't see it passing, certainly not immediately, because again, that would probably uh, bring uh, rebellion in the ranks. But I certainly see elements of it um, somehow being, being used in, in, in other trade agreements or parts of it being pulled, pulled away, because the importance of this is that the business groups have worked hard on this, and this is almost like a wish list of intellectual property and labor and environment and procurement in so many areas that they were so close to actually uh, getting and bringing home. I think TPP, the title TPP is dead, but TPP in another fashion and in another sense, I wouldn't be surprised if you see that somewhere down the line. Yeah. Bill, your thoughts on that or the USEU trade deal? Yeah, deals? so I think we have to frame this in a broader construct of a populist, um, protectionist uprising around the world. We saw it with Brexit. We saw it with Trump's election. We saw it in Italy in the most recent uh, voting there. Um, and that, I think, makes it politically hard to do trade anywhere in the world at the moment. Um, I think the transatlantic agreement is dead for another reason, which is that the EU is in a moment of inward-looking crisis, with the Brits pulling out, uh, with Italy's future uncertain after the recent uh, referendum. Um, there's no new trade deals with Europe until Europe Europe gets its house of cards um, together uh, and negotiates the terms of exit for Britain uh, and then sees where it's going. Uh, on TPP in the United States, it is worth remembering that no major trade deal has ever been both signed 
and ratified under the same president. Um, it usually takes time. Um, I think TPP is absolutely dead in the Trump administration. But four years from now, um, it's still going to be sitting there uh, and could be resurrected. Uh, I hope it is. OK. So the forecast then from you both seems to be TPP is dead. And for you, Bill, at least, the US-EU deal is also not going anywhere. So how do you think these or potentially other more protectionist policies would impact American businesses and, through that, the American consumer? Um, you know, I think they're designed, or at least intended as Trump frames them, uh, to protect the American consumer, particularly the American worker. Um, I think in the short term, sure, it may be good for a few American workers if their jobs um, stay in the United States. Uh, in the longer term, I think this is bad for American workers. I think it's bad because um, those jobs are not going to stay here forever, um, and this prevents the sort of natural need to, to change the economic basis uh, of some of these regions communities, and that's painful, um, but that may be in people's long-term interest. For American consumers, it's another bad. It's bad because uh, goods are going to cost more if there are high tariffs on them. Uh, and for American businesses, as we just heard, part of what TPP would have done is raise these other countries up to the level that our businesses have to operate at, um, and would have created a more equal playing field for our companies that already meet these standards, and we've just given up the chance to bring these other countries up to the standards that we abide by. Okay. Jerome, your thoughts, please. I, I agree 100% that the, the, the what was contained in TPP was so important for business groups that you won't see anything immediately, but that the idea that the labor and environment and procurement provisions will be resurrected at some point. It's hard to say because of world events, you know, whether that's one year, four years, six years, but business groups have worked on this for such a long time. I think you'll see a continual push and also as consumers feel a pinch of goods, say there is a mini trade war or trade barriers or other protectionist measures, as consumers feel a pinch of goods that they've been used to buying at fairly low prices, the public sentiment could start to shift, which would possibly work its way to Capitol Hill. Right. And as a follow up, Jerome, given the fact that, you know, there is uh, business groups have a, have a good deal amount of amount of influence on the Hill uh, and in American politics on both sides of the aisle. Um, what are your thoughts on how this impacts the way Congress does its business vis-a-vis -vis these trade policies? Meaning, um, again, the orthodoxy in the GOP has been traditionally uh, pro-business, pro-free trade, market economics. So uh, how do you think in the short term this is going to play out in Washington? In the short term, you'll have to look more toward the bilateral trade deals. The Republicans on the Hill are anxious to do a deal with the UK, as Professor White said, once it's out of the EU. But initially what you'll see is maybe some revisions to NAFTA. Uh, assuming that deal is open and Mexico and Canada both feel that they actually get something out of a revised NAFTA because it won't be a one-way ticket. We'll open it only to appease uh, U.S. interests. So you may see some revisions there. You may see some movement on bilateral trade deals with other trading partners. But the big multilateral deals for now, I think, are pretty much on the back burner. All right. So on that note, the big multilateral deals and multilateralism generally, and the U.S. has typically been in the lead as a, as, a, as a global player on the world stage. How do you think this somewhat new trajectory or new trajectory for the United States <coughs> is going to play out not only in the, in the international economic arena, but also diplomatically? Um, I'm sad to say, but I think it's devastating. Um, when I was in Asia this past week, uh, I talked to government officials from uh, Singapore, from Chile, um, from uh, Vietnam, and these are countries that have made these enormous sacrifices to join the TPP, and now we're the ones who back out. So we're undermining our credibility uh, with those countries. Uh, the only people I talked to who were happy were the Chinese, who see a real opening here um, to have their trade agreement be the lead agreement, to begin to pull the United States uh, away from or separate it from its 
allies in the region uh, and to establish their own leadership um, on international trade issues. I fear that we will look back on this moment in 20 years as the moment that the United States said, fine, we're happy to cede our leadership uh, of the international institutional order that we built after World War II um, and that has allowed for the last 70 years of prosperity and opportunity. Uh, and I worry that we're going to let that slip away. Sure, but that is also that the discontent with globalization and its impacts domestically mm -hmm. also contributed to voters handing Donald Trump the White House. So what isn't working then about globalization um, for the U.S. and others? Uh, two things. The first is that a lot of people have been left behind, um, and we have not done enough to keep those people, uh, giving them opportunities, uh, making sure they're not left behind, structuring deals uh, that have mechanisms in them uh, to help people whose jobs may be dislocated, and we have failed at that. And secondly, we failed at communication. We failed at showing we, the you know, elites who sit in you know, law schools and, and other places, um, but also the trade officials and, and government officials, of showing people People that these uh, opportunities are really in our collective best interest. They make the U.S. economically stronger and on TPP particularly politically stronger in a very fraught region. And we have to rethink the entire communication uh, around trade uh, at the same time as we make sure that it does more for those who will be dislocated uh, in the process. I, I agree, especially with the communication piece. During the election when trade was being berated as the worst thing out there, you didn't hear voices standing up uh, from uh, you know, across the board saying, wait a minute, remember the benefits as well. So while there's dislocation, while there's shifts in, in jobs and employment, the U.S. and every other country benefits from trade. We benefit from goods coming in. We benefit with jobs from, from products that we send to Europe, to Asia, to Mexico. So the communication part, I think, is a key. And that's why I think there's still a little hope, the idea that people can be, uh, people can be uh, informed of the idea that, hey, this is not all bad, that there's good. And the part about helping those displaced by trade, I think, is the other key. Those two things seems like if, you're, if they're able to get a consensus on the Hill and with the administration, then you could see a shift in sentiment on this because there are many benefits that were never really spoken about during the election. Any other areas of trade we should be thinking about? Jerome? Yes, I think Cuba is a major topic that could change the order and the dynamics of trade and international economics and policy. The death of Fidel Castro is suddenly taking, taking away an impediment in many ways, it hasn't ended all that. So we won't be opening up trade, especially with the uh, sentiment of the president and many on the Hill. But this is interesting now that Cuba is on the forefront again. China's dealing with Cuba, Canada's dealing with Cuba, and so is the EU. I think that's something to watch because we may be forced as a country to do something um, as far as taking action, as far as trade and other uh, developments there that we didn't intend to because of the international dynamics. Bill? Um, I think the, the thing that strikes me the most here is just the, the domestic politics um, of both on the left and right, the attack we've seen on trade. Um, and figuring out where new leadership is going to come from around these issues uh, is going to be a real challenge. Um, it's not going to be from the Elizabeth Warren side of the Democratic Party or the Donald Trump side of the Republican Party. Um, and we need that leadership domestically because other countries have that leadership and are willing to push forward and are sitting there laughing at us as we're fighting with ourselves. Um, and so we've got to get our house back together, um, and the time uh, to do so is really limited. Okay, well, great. So as of this taping, we're still a few weeks away from the inauguration. So um, to be determined, and it, I think clearly there's a lot more to talk about after January 20th. So Joe Ashton from Bloomberg Law, Bill Burke-White here from Penn, thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Case in Point.